and welcome to Seattle Opera's Connected Screen Time with Seattle Opera. And today we're featuring Yasmin Kiss. She is our production stage manager, and we're looking to have a wonderful conversation with her today for about 30 minutes. We're trying a new format this week, um, and you are welcome to use the Q&A function on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to ask questions as we have this lovely, lovely dialogue. Yasmin, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Glenn Hare, and I'm a sen Senior Communications Manager at Seattle Opera. And um, so just to get started, Yasmin, how would you best describe your role at Seattle Opera? My role is I, I function as sort of the air traffic controller of the productions. So the, the specific job that I do, the production stage management job, generally starts about a week or two ahead of the rehearsals. We prepare the spaces, we get everything ready. During rehearsals, we run all the rehearsals, we set all the props. Um, take care of everything sort of in the rehearsal hall to make sure the artists have what they need. And then we take the show to the stage. While we're doing all that, we're also the sort of main communication hub for the artistic team communicating with the company at large. And then on uh, when we get to the stage, we create all the paperwork and all of the information for the crews to be able to blend everyone seamlessly together to make the show successful. How is that different from just sort of just letting people know what, what's happening? I mean, is there a script that you have that you then convey to everyone else and it's something that they memorize or is it something that you call and do moment to moment? Uh, in terms of the the general work or the cue calling? The general work. So basically the artistic team, uh, which usually consists of the director, the stage director, uh, the conductor, right? Um, mm -hmm. Then you have uh, your designers and depending on if the show is a brand new show or if it's um, a production we've rented, we may or may not have the designers involved, but that could be a scenic designer, lighting designer, um, costume designer, projection designer. There's many uh, disciplines. Those are kind of standard these days. Projection every now and then. Um, they have already sort of roughed out a sketch of what they think they're going to do with the show. So when the director arrives and the conductor arrives and we start rehearsals, we then add in the first layer are the singers, right? So the singers arrive knowing the music, but they don't necessarily understand the world in which they'll be inhabiting. So that's the job of the director to, to create that world with the singers in the rehearsals. Myself as the stage manager and the staff, the assistant stage managers of which there are usually two, and a production assistant, we then are the conduit of information from that rehearsal room. If the director says, now you'll enter carrying a candle, we are the ones who make sure the candle is there. And if the director says, oh, the candle is too tall, we write production notes onto our colleagues in the crew to say, the candle is too tall, can you provide some options for them to choose from or different things for them to work from? So we, we are uh, the people who sort of help them move along the artistic process and try to make it as seamless as possible so that they can just focus on creating that work and not worrying about what is or is not wrong there. Right, right, right. Um, what's your relationship like between um, you and say um, the artists that come in? Um, do you interact with them? on a regular basis? Um, are you like their go-to person um, when they uh, arrive with an, a challenge or an obstacle? Uh, I, so generally those visiting artists, the principal singers uh, tend to be our most uh, visiting artists besides of course the artistic team. And yes, stage management are their main contact for anything they need. And they know that. So mm -hmm. The stage 
manager's job, no matter where they are. If they have a question, they come to us. And because they're pretty confident that if we don't know the answer, we at least know the direction. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we are the ones in the room who are there to be helpful and to support that artistic work. So regardless of if it's something as easy as, I don't know where the closest grocery store is to, um, I have some concerns about my costume, right? Mm -hmm. Any, anything in between we sort of handle. So it's not unusual. Sort of like a, yeah. yeah, you're sort of like a concierge. In a, in a, in a way, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, you know, we have colleagues in the artistic department. Um, Paula Podemski, our company manager, sort of takes care of a lot more um, lifestyle things. Uh, when I got it. Go to the doctor and housing, mm -hmm. and travel, mm -hmm. and that sort of business. Whereas stage management is just there to make the day-to-day -day experience as um, as easy as possible so they can we just remove whatever obstacles we can so that they can just focus on doing the job they're here to do right right um how did you get involved in 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 being a opera stage manager i know you've been at seattle opera for quite a, a quite a while but how did that all get started i uh I come from a, a European background. My mother was German. My father was Hungarian. Uh, my mother came from a family of people who loved opera. And so there was always music in our household grew, growing up. So I was very familiar with it. And then when I went to college, I went to school in Chicago at DePaul University. And they mm -hmm. had a theater school within it, um, a conservatory. And so I was accepted there to become a stage manager. And in my freshman year, um, there was a woman who was a year, two years ahead of me in school. And she uh, sort of wrote me into doing a project with her at a church in Chicago. And we did a Traviata and it was my first opera. And that was when I was 18 actually. And so through her, Rachel Henneberry, she's actually a stage manager at Chicago Lyric. Uh, she, she sort of dragged me along to various opera programs and I flirted back and forth with uh, doing straight theater and then doing opera, but eventually just ended up streamlining straight into opera only because it, the, the pace of it and the style of it and the artistic form appealed to me much more than straight theater did. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a much better fit for me because it wasn't nearly as um, it didn't have the, the more obnoxious aspects of, of sort of uh, <laughs> performance in it. I found mm -hmm. it um, a world in which people were generally good natured, happy to be there. Uh, they do their work, they get things done. No one is interested in wasting anyone's time. It's a very elegant and efficient sort of workplace. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me a little bit about what your day is like on performance day, on performance night? On performance night, that's actually my easiest day. Uh, the, really? Yeah, because the crews themselves actually, they're the ones who are first in the door. Mm -hmm. So they generally arrive at the theater, uh, depending on what work needs to be done in the afternoon. And they do all the systems checks and make sure all the lights are working and all the uh, whatever tech things we're using, everything is, is in proper working condition. Um, I generally, myself and the stage managers don't arrive to the theater until generally the one hour call. Um, there's usually one member of our team, we kind of round robin it, that shows up at the theater uh, for the first hair and makeup call, but we're just a backup in mm -hmm. case one of the performers is lost or missing or forgot or it needs something, right? One mm -hmm. of us is yeah. always in the building for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally we show up at hour and then the first thing we do, uh, the crew comes back from dinner and we all meet together on stage. And at Seattle Opera, um, we always do a blackout check, which mm -hmm. means we turn out all the lights on stage and in the house and we make sure that there isn't an errant work light that's pointing in the wrong direction or some other uh, light that would sort of ruin those final moments uh, in a show when you do those blackouts or anything like that. You, um, so we start with that. And then uh, 
about 15 minutes later, we open the house and uh, I sit backstage and I call all the typical things you've seen in the movies, one hour call, 45 minutes, half hour, and all the various sort of iterations of that. And then uh, we start and that the starting time is very specifically decided based on how long the opera is, what the orchestra contract says, uh, how many folks are in the audience, how bad traffic is. There's lots of things that go into when we're exactly starting. Uh, but I am the keeper of the clocks. And so uh, I'm the one who sort of get, has everyone on their time check moments so that we are starting at the appropriate time. And then Allison writes in that sometimes I do give a quick patron tour and she is, she is right. Sometimes yeah. 7.05, uh, I uh, have the pleasure of having a couple people join me backstage uh, with Allison or a member of development. And we do a little five or 10 minute walk around uh, so they can feel kind of the stillness backstage before it all begins. Wow, so I guess like um, any, so go back to your analogy of a, a traf air traffic controller, it's the ground team, you know, the people who get the plane to the gate, the people right. who unload it, um, people who clean the planes and all those other sort of things that makes your job so much um, easier. They do a lot of the heavy lifting and you're up here um, making sure that everything is sort of orchestrated and coordinated in a smooth pattern. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, they do all the heavy lifting. I right. just, I just, I, you know, do the dusting of powdered sugar on top. Mm. Um, if you're just joining us, um, welcome. Um, my guest this afternoon is Yasmin Kies, and I am Glenn Harris, Senior Communications Manager. As you have probably realized listening that um, Yasmin is our um, production stage manager at Seattle Opera, and we're talking about what she does for a living. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank all of our patrons. Um, without your um, continued generosity and support, um, the work that we do at Seattle Opera is not possible, and we are certainly grateful for it. Um, Yasmin, yes. is there a language barrier that sometimes happens when you're working with international artists, and how do you navigate that? So generally, we start having production meetings about a year in advance of a, mm. of a show. So we see names on the list of performers or artistic teams that are unfamiliar to us. We immediately begin researching, is that person able to speak English with fluency that will allow us to be able to do our best work? So we try to, to hit it far enough in advance to give Paula Podemski, our company manager, a little bit of runway because she um, is also the main coordinator of our volunteers and our artist aides. And they are our first line of defense when we have singers who uh, may have a language barrier. So Paula will begin to sort of ask if anyone has time and would be interested in being a translator. And so we've had that happen a couple times in rehearsal where uh, people who perhaps are fluent in Italian and um, don't speak English fluently uh, will need to have a volunteer translator who can help them at costume fittings or that sort of thing. In the rehearsal hall, it's actually quite lovely because you probably in any given rehearsal hall anywhere in America in an operatic world, you probably have someone who can speak most sort of the top five languages in the room at all times. Um, people who do opera for a living tend to have uh, enormous language capabilities because of the work. I myself am fluent in German, which is really helpful doing uh, all the Wagner that we've done in the last 20 years, which has been great. Um, a lot of German singers as well, it's been very helpful. Italian is something that's kind of a common tongue and many people in the rehearsal room are fluent. Uh, so that's generally easy. The conductor can help a little bit or the director, you know, has a little Italian. Um, so it happens, it happens quite uh, often actually. Mm -hmm. But between all of us, we seem to be able to make it work. Um, what's the, your favorite part of your job? Uh, the people. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, the people that I have been so fortunate to have 20 year long relationships with, the singers who I did shows with at Minnesota Opera 20 years ago that I still see today, right? It's, um, there's a beautiful longevity and, and sort of wonderful arc to this work, which feels like a very lo large world. But the truth is, it's, it's a tiny, tiny niche sort of a business. Um, I did, I actually, I, so my, I'm a contract employee at the opera. So I usually am uh, off for a couple weeks in June uh, before we start the summer opera. Last year, I was fortunate enough to be able to do a project in New York with a director friend, Kevin Newbery, who's a director who's done many shows with us. And um, I did a project with him. We rehearsed in New York City and we performed at the Philadelphia Orchestra. And it was um, full of singers, some of which were Broadway singers and some were opera singers. And uh, one of which was a good colleague named Bill Burden. And um, I hadn't seen Bill, he hadn't come and done a show with us here at the opera in maybe eight years. And it was the first time I'd seen him and it was so lovely. And getting to spend time with him again um, was really incredible. It's those relationships, I think, that are really the best part of this job because it mm -hmm. just makes everything easier. Um, could you talk about calling a show? And this is a particular question, all those sticky notes in your score. Sure. So uh, calling a show, the, what that specifically means is saying the words out loud on some sort of advice that allows the crew to hear you and do things based on what I'm saying, right? So when you're sitting in the audience, uh, the music begins and maybe 20 seconds in, suddenly the curtain goes out. Um, that's not an arbitrary choice. It's not that I felt the music move me in such a way and that was the perfect moment I felt that night to pull the curtain out. Basically what happens when uh, we all move into the theater together is we spend the days in what we call lighting sessions where myself and the artistic team, uh, directors, scenic designer, costume, uh, not costume designer during the day in the lighting, but in the lighting designer, we all sort of get together and they create the art. They decide that is the exact moment I want to see the curtain go out. And I then build uh, all the building blocks that allow that to happen. So yes, there's a sticky note. In my case, they're little stickers. And I put a sticker in my book that says rail Q1, right? Mm -hmm. So the rail is where the curtain gets pulled out. And so I, give that information to the assistant stage managers. They input it into paperwork, which allows the rail crew to know that rail Q1 is the curtain goes out in a 10 second queue, something mm -hmm. like that. And then that's how the information sort of flows. So my, my book then becomes full of sticky notes that say rail Q1 or lights 26, these various queues. And then backing it up further, we usually do a, a five minute warning so that the crews know to be in position. At Seattle Opera, we also do a one minute warning so they know to stand at attention. And then 30 seconds, they're lifting their arms so that as soon as I say curtain go, they're pulling. Oh. All very regimented. Um, here is a, another question that has to do about starting on time. You've alluded to that um, you're in, uh, you have a, 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 an understanding of what's happening in the hall, maybe some of the traffic conditions, some backstage things happening. And so this viewer wants to know why uh, performances hardly ever start on the advertised, at the advertised moment. That, that's a secret. No, it's not really. Um, what it actually is, in truth, I don't know if I'm telling tales out of school, but um, the ticket start time is 7.30. The orchestra start time is 7.35. And the reason that that exists is because sometimes five minutes makes all the difference as to whether or not we finish on time or not, right? And 
the truth is, although we would wish that 3,000 people could all show up at McCall Hall and be sitting in their seat at exactly 7.30, that's not a reality. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that 20 years ago when they started changing the orchestra um, contract, it was specifically because of that, because mm -hmm. it's always going to be the person that has trouble with the parking machine or um, someone who needs to run to the restroom before we start. Because of that, it's important to us twofold that all of the audience members who purchase tickets are given um, the, the best option to, to get to their seat on time. And then mm -hmm. secondly, that we are using um, the, the funds we have been given to pay all our various disciplines are being used in the most judicious way possible. And utilizing what we call an increment of overtime with the orchestra, which can be quite a costly thing uh, because we didn't start at the appropriate time is a misuse of those funds. Mm -hmm. So it really, out of respect to them, out of respect to the audience, there is this strange uh, situation where the ticket says 7.30, but we usually start at 7.35. Mm. That's interesting. Um, can you tell us about um, a time in your career when something went, quote unquote, dreadfully wrong during a performance? Uh, many times. Um, <laughs> But my, my favorite, I think, was when I was at Santa Fe Opera. Uh, we were doing a magic flute. And there was a, a sort of the floor of the set um, at a certain point went up and became sort of a frame. And then it was supposed to go back down. And during one performance, it sort of got stuck on a step and wouldn't go <laughs> down. And Natalie Desai, was coming out to sing her aria. And she noticed that the floor was not going out, going down. And so she stopped singing and turned to the audience and said, clearly this is not how this is supposed to go. <laughs> and ran away. And the conductor just sat there, just completely in shock. Everyone stopped. And the crew came out and they fixed whatever was broken and then sort of scuttled back in. And uh, we began the music again as the floor went down the way it was intended to. And the audience just loves it. They love it so much every single time something goes wrong. Um, <laughs> you know, we, uh, when we did the Trovatore, the most recent one just a couple years ago, Dan Miller's, um, there was a scene with some uh, gravestones on stage and one of the singers, mm -hmm. Mike Hayes, remember pushes one of the, the gravestones down and it sort of thunks to the stage. and you know, that prop had been built, it was pre-cut, everyone understood how far it was gonna go. We had had multiple conversations with the singers about you don't have to push it, you just have to kind of move <laughs> your hands, right? And um, Mike Mays was just so excited one night that he really gave it a shove. And it, you could, you could see it bouncing all the way down the rake. And then there was this insane moment where I heard 3,000 people gasp. And I knew, oh my God, it was going in the pit, right? I mean, it was, <laughs> it was terrifying and amazing. But hearing 3,000 people go, oh, was uh, pretty incredible. Mm. No one was injured. Everything was fine. Right. I think the conductor actually said, everything's OK. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any interesting ring stories? Um, I mean, there's a, there's a thousand ring stories. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, of course, I, I'm sure that there are many people here who saw the fateful Goethe Demerung when our automated rigging system went down and uh, we actually had to pause for a little while while we sorted all that out. Um, you know, the... Uh, it, the good ring stories, I think, are, are a lot based on the people, right? Um, the, the thing about the Wadsworth ring was the, uh, the, the specific group of singers that Spade had kind of pulled together and the artistic team and Stephen Wadsworth and his kind of vision of this green ring and the fact that so many of them came back year after year. Um, it was... It was pretty incredible. Uh, I wasn't around the first time they did it when the Siegfried fell on the treadmill 
I think it was the day mm -hmm. before opening night and um, he was not able to uh, walk the role, but I think he may be saying it from a chair. Uh, I feel like there might be someone out there who knows better than I do. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have an adequate ring story prepared. There's mm -hmm. many small hijinks, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, one of our uh, uh, assistant directors actually ended up having to be a flying Rhine maiden in one <laughs> performance because one of the Rhine maidens who uh, they had this uh, choreography where they flew um, became very ill before a mm -hmm. performance. And so Gina Lipinski, uh, who's a director at the Metropolitan, she um, actually flew one of the shows, which was incredible. <laughs> Um, I have a question about paperwork, and uh, I think this viewer wants to a better understanding of what kind of forms and documents are being passed around between um, the various parts of, sure. of the production team. Uh, everything you might expect. Things mm -hmm. as simple as contact sheets, which are exactly what they sound like. They are um, specific documents that have everyone's phone numbers on them, uh, sometimes email, depending on the situation. Uh, then we do, uh, we create entire packets of information actually for all the visiting artists, which have all the typical things uh, you would expect if you were a visitor coming from out of town. They have maps, they have addresses, they mm -hmm. have calendars. Um, we create daily schedules on a daily basis um, that uh, allow us to give the information on to the singers as to what their expectation is call wise. And then throughout the rehearsal process, we do production notes, as I said, which are just a list of all the notes of what happens in the rehearsal, which are used as a conversation starter uh, mm -hmm. between the director and the, the various groups, the costume shop, the hair and makeup shop, or the technical department uh, to problem solve things that come up along the way. And then during the shows, uh, we do running paperwork, as I've mentioned, which uh, basically just looks like lists of all the cues and the correct time and that sort of business. All of our paperwork is generally done in Word and Excel. Um, mm -hmm. That's industry standard. Uh, because stage managers tend to roam all around the world and right. if there was specific uh, uh, specific software that companies use, it becomes problematic because you don't have the luxury of time to be able to train people in those specific kinds of software. Right, right, right. Oh, uh, another question from a viewer wants to know about a difficult diva or divo without mentioning that person's name. Uh, I'll leave that one up to you if you want to answer or not. Uh, I'm sorry, ask me again. I missed the first part. Yeah, they want to they wanna know if you've had to deal with a difficult singer. And um, oh. mentioning their names, uh, sure. that person's name. Um, yeah. How did, you, how did you manage that, that challenge? You know, you know, it's very interesting because you end up um, you know, uh, an operatic workplace is sort of like an office workplace, right? So mm -hmm. in an office, you have, you know, various kinds of people. You've got the guy that never stops talking and, you know, the woman who's, you know, I don't know, doing something. It's the same in an opera workplace. We don't have um, people who are more difficult than sort of any other workplace. Um, through the years, I can probably think of three people that were really, um, difficult to to work with and looking at it from the backside you sort of realize that these are people who uh probably have enough going on in their own lives that they're mm -hmm. not able to sort of see the forest through the trees right right but there certainly was a singer who was um so scared so scared to sing the role and really had no confidence in himself in any way, shape, or form, and he did create a lot of problems for people. And um, Spate was so kind about it, but, but towards the end, he sort of kept saying, I know, I know, I won't bring him back, which was um, very sweet. But it, um, you know, things like having to um, give them spritzes of nasal spray, they would stick their little head off stage and get nasal spray during the show. You know, these sort of placebo effect things that kind of 
um, gave them whatever they needed to kind of feel better to move forward and be able to do the singing. And you know, the, the bummer about it is they sound amazing, right? Mm -hmm. But it's all about how you are feeling internally and what you think you need um, to be able mm -hmm. to get through it. And no amount of you sound amazing is helpful in that moment, right? So right. support. Yeah. Um, I've never had a situation where there was someone who was so out of control uh, that we, we couldn't work with them, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, there have mm -hmm. been definitely situations where you have to pull in Christina or Aaron or someone sort of of a higher level than us to support and see if maybe they can help them find whatever they need. Right, right. So there's a, a stereotype that sort of goes along with that with those words diva or diva that yeah there singers. is and you know that was in the 80s i think yeah i think those singers existed in the 70s and the 80s i don't i've never really seen them um right. because you know but also none of us um on the west coast uh tend to work in that way right mm -hmm. it, I believe very much that we all deserve the same respect and the same kindness and the same um, treatment regardless of who you are. It doesn't actually matter. We're all getting together to make this art together and you are no more important than I am. It's, right. it's you know, it's, a, it's, it's very equal uh, in how it sort of runs today than how it was 40 years ago. Right. Uh, you've talked about in the past that, you know, Seattle Opera is different. And um, could you allude to or explain um, what sets our company apart from some of the others that you've worked with? Seattle Opera tends to uh, have this amazing staff and crew and chorus and supers and actors who all want to be there. Um, there, I I've never actually I I have I have seen I have seen that in some other places, but not for twenty years. Mm -hmm. um, sort of everyone who works here and everyone who's a part of the organization really truly wants to be here, and that means that the work is hard because the work is hard, not because the people have created a situation that is inherently difficult, right? Um, so it means you can focus more of your day dealing with the problems of the work, such as that candlestick is not tall enough and it keeps mm. falling over, right? That's a yeah. problem I have to solve. I don't have to solve the problem that you know, Mary won't talk to Anne, and now I can't get this thing done, um, and it's costing the company money. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have that here. Uh, you really have just uh, an incredible group of people who want to be here. And mm -hmm. um, also, the fact that you have a, a crew and um, the costume shop and all sorts of people that have been here for decades. It actually makes a huge difference when you have someone who knows every inch of sort of what is in the building and what, it, what we're capable of, what we've done in the past, what you can attach to this thing here and do this. Mm -hmm. It's just, it makes us more nimble, uh, mm -hmm. which makes the environment um, more interesting to be a part of. Uh, a question about last minute costume malfunctions and how is that handled? <laughs> uh, we have incredible people backstage who um, will, uh, basically if there is a problem, like let's say a gentleman has torn his pants, which has happened, um, I basically get on the God mic and say, I need a dresser to stage right with needle and thread immediately. And then the assistant stage manager waits to grab them. And when the dresser comes running backstage, the assistant stage manager will bring them straight over to the singer and they'll sort of whip stitch something together and send them back on stage. <laughs> and there's a lot of weird problem solving. It's a great show when you have someone in a maid costume because you can send a maid on stage at any moment and they can sort of sweep their way over to whatever's wrong on stage and fix it and sort of sweep their way off stage. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's, 
there's lots of weird little things that will happen that sometimes the audience is aware of and sometimes not. If a singer splits their pants, you're sort of deeply hopeful that maybe nobody noticed. Oh, so the next time I see a maid with a broom that doesn't have <laughs> the going across the stage, I'm going mm -hmm. to be mindful of that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see what else we have in uh, in way of questions that are coming in. We, you already talked a little bit about this. Um, uh, a viewer wants to know what's the best part of your job, and you've already mentioned the people mm -hmm. and the close knit community that um, that makes up the opera world. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything else? The music. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I uh, I didn't realize that I was so music centric until. I really sort of dug deep into this profession. Once I really sort of um, had it become a part of my life, uh, when I sort of jumped on and decided this was the only way I was gonna go, it's, it's pretty incredible to be in a room full of uh, the world's best musicians every single day. It's, it's quite a gift, I have mm -hmm. to. It is, it is. I've only been at the upper for a short time, um, going on two years, but I'm always amazed when I see the passion, the artistry, the imagination, the creativity, the, the sweat yeah. that happens um, yeah. before, during, and after a performance. It, yeah. it is quite remarkable to witness. Um, one last question here. Um, a viewer wants to know about actually visiting or meeting some of the performers after the after a performance. Um, sure. Yeah. And is it uh, possible? So we do have a stage door at McCall. Mm -hmm. If you exit out the front doors and sort of go to your right around the building, there's a double door and it says stage door. Mm -hmm. And you are always welcome to wait outside there and um, meet the performers and they can um, give you an autograph or something like that. Um, they uh, were not able to uh, bring people who aren't friends or close uh, guests of the performers upstairs into the building. But I do know Seattle Opera does a lot of tours mm -hmm. and reach and um, there are various ways that you can get a backstage tour um, mm -hmm. that's interesting to you but if you mm -hmm. want to say hi to the artist that's your best bet well I think we've gone a little over time so I'm going to close this out um, by saying Yasmin thank you so much for this wonderful conversation um, next week we will have a, the award-winning soprano uh, Sandra Radovan, Radovanovsky um, in our um, So Connected segment on next Thursday. And as a reminder, Give Big is continuing. Today, or yesterday was supposed to be the last uh, day of the two-day campaign, but it is being extended through May 15th. And if you are so inspired by the conversation that we've had with Yasmin, um, maybe inspired by some of the performances that you've seen, um, I encourage you, invite you to donate. Again, the donations of our patrons and our closest family members, um, they drive us, they sustain us. And at this time, sustaining is what we're all about. So I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon and uh, see you around.